Okay, so real quick, I want to do another video on computation. This is going to be a follow-up video to the last one. This is going to go over analyzing time complexities, which is going to be, again, a follow-up to algorithms that we previously looked at. So it's going to take a look. So, asymptotic complexity. Previously, we discussed particular time complexities, and this is going to be where we start, actually, because this time it's going to be asymptotic time complexity. So, that is basically just the rate of asymptotic growth of the algorithm's time complexity function, which is what we looked at last time. And essentially, the time complexity is analyzing as the number of inputs grow for an algorithm. How does that affect the generated number of computations it has to do? So we looked at various rates of growth. So that would be logarithmic, linear, linear rhythmic, quadratic, various things like that. That's analyzed in the time complexity. But with asymptotic growth, we have a few more variances that we can look at and particular details as well. Now, as we've already stated though, algorithm's execution time can be reduced by optimizing the code to favor instructions that execute in less time than others. So essentially what we want to do is to improve the performance on our algorithm. We want to look into different types of instructions that just compute in less time. So it takes less clock cycles on the CPU and overall just less operations that have to be done individually. Now the classification of functions using big O, big omega, and big theta, also called asymptotic notation, this essentially provides a way to concisely characterize the asymptotic growth of a function. These three notations are what we're going to use to compare various algorithms against each other. If we can actually quantify their rate of growth against each other, we can determine which ones are going to be more optimal in particular scenarios. Now, I will say when it comes to asymptotic notation, asymptotic growth, and all this different analysis, it's not set in stone. It's not a cut and dry, 100% accurate way to characterize individual algorithms in specific scenarios. Sometimes, based on how many inputs you're processing, it can vary, especially if you're doing with very small inputs, then asymptotic notation kind of loses a lot of its credence. We are going to be more analyzing very high level inputs because we care about actually analyzing the rate of growth. Because if we have 100,000 inputs on something that's logarithmic versus linear, then obviously linear is going to perform categorically worse. Generally, it's not guaranteed to perform worse, but just on a average case, you can determine it should perform worse. And I'll get more into that later. Now, let's take a look at the three asymptotic notations. First, we have a big O. This is going to serve as a rough upper bound for our functions. We can disregard constants, small inputs. They're not going to have enough impact on the scale of our algorithm's output to really play a factor. We care mostly about the actual major input of n at larger quantities. So maybe in the regards of like 10,000 to 100,000 would be a good metric. Anything beyond that, obviously it's going to scale, but something in these earlier rounds are going to be really representative of the scale of our asymptotic growth. Same thing goes for big omega, except for this serves as a rough lower bound. So these two are mirrors of each other essentially, and we'll touch more on that in a bit. But we have this third one of big theta, and it is solely used to verify that two functions or, or more have identical growth rates. So what this means is if one has a linear growth rate, then the other one it also have a linear growth rate. And we can view this as the average bound. So let's take a look at the upper and lower bounds regarding big O and big omega real quick. We know that we're going to use these to analyze and compare growth rates between multiple algorithms. And determine these notations can give us a better look at their asymptotic growth rates in comparison to each other. This exactly right here. This is not cut and dry. 
using asymptotic notation, asymptotic growth is not well, specifically asymptotic notation, the big O and the big omega, up bound, lower bound, is not going to be cut and dry on X algorithm is better than Y algorithm just because it has a better asymptotic notation. It just gives us something to characterize the rate of growth we can expect to see over the course of time as the input grows. Now, does it mean that something that's linear is always going to outperform something that's linear rhythmic or something like that? You can have different scenarios where the inputs, depending on how small or large they may be, there might be some overlaps where smaller inputs on a worse rate of growth has a faster performance. This is typically why we disregard very small inputs because they're not going to be truly quantifiable of a, I guess, a growth rate scaling. So it's a good top level view of how we can compare algorithms, but it's not just the end all be all. This one is always going to be better than the other one in terms of like a linear versus another linear, for example. We can tell they have pretty identical growth rates by the big theta notation. But when we start looking at big O, well, we can see we have linear, right? And then we have something that may be quadratic. Well, we can tell that this is going to be big O in because it's going to have technically a worse growth rate and at that point he can make a general assumption that because this is in the upper bound of this one we would more prefer to use the linear one over logarithmic now again it's not always cut and dry that linear will always outperform logarithmic but we can make an educated assumption that yes linear for most cases will be a better fit for what we want to do so that's what we actually use this for it's not cut and dry gonna outperform it every single time that's not what this is for so, looking at the upper bound specifically big o notation we let f and g be two functions that map positive integers to all real numbers greater than or equal to what it's mapped from so we have f of n equals big O g of n if they're positive constant c and n zero such that for any positive integer input that is greater than or equal to n zero which is going to be our point of crossover for our two functions here then f of n must be less than or equal to some constant times g of n lots of words lots of uh, variables being thrown around here so again we have two functions and we can chart these out so this is the number of inputs and this is the number of computations going up okay so we have the tracking of two different algorithms f of n is this line here and g of n is this so we have some point of crossover where this input when it scales f of n will always be, well, less than or equal to constant g of n. So we can determine that this is big O, we have an upper bound, therefore f of n equals big O of n. Okay, so looking at the lower bound, we should end up with something akin to the opposite. That's going to be big omega notation. So let f and g be two functions, all positive integers to all real numbers greater than or equal to, just like the previous one. If f of n equals big omega g of n, again we have two functions, f and g, we have the omega notation. If there are positive constants c and n zero, such that for any positive integer input that is greater than or equal to n zero, the crossover point here, then f of n should be greater than or equal to some constant times g of n. And we can tell here that yeah we do have that so this is what we mean by the lower bound this is 
over in this. So we end up with f of n. The big omega. Okay. Moving on, we have the big theta notation. Now, this is where we're going to talk about that coefficient specifically that we're multiplying a second function by. This, we still have our two functions, f and g. No big deal there. All positive integers mapping to real numbers greater than or equal to it. And then we have f of n equals big theta g of n. If and only if f of n is greater than or equal to c1 times g of n. And f of n is less than or equal to c2 times g of n. And essentially, what this means is that we need it to be both big O and big omega. Because one is gonna be coefficient that is less than the function. This is gonna be the big omega part. And then one is gonna be coefficient that is greater than the original function. And this is gonna be big O. But this means that they are both greater than or equal to. And less than or equal to, which you look at it, perfectly fine, is essentially it just means that they are equal to each other, which is what we mean by having identical rates of growth. The coefficients, again, like we stated, we can ignore constant values in certain aspects because it's not going to continue to affect it too much to a degree. But at this point, we determine that at some point, the second function is going to be better, and at another point, it will be worse just based on a coefficient, which means that both of these should have comparable rates of growth. Neither one is necessarily better than the other one, neither one is necessarily worse than the other one. They just have pretty much the same. It's basically we have linear, linear, one week, quadratic, quadratic. And this is most of what we care about. But basically, theta exists to say there's not too much distinction between two functions rate of growth. So, Overall, it's not too bad. Now, there is also a natural relationship between big O and big omega. So again, if we have our two functions, then if we have f of n equal to big omega g of n, then we also have g of n is equal to big O f of n. And you can tell that because if we have chart we have two functions here um, then you can tell here we have some crossover point this is going to be in zero and maybe let's see I've been big omega g of n so g of n here f of n here regardless you can tell that if we have f of n greater than g of n, then we also basically have g of n being less than f of n or some constant beyond this n zero. So oh, there is always going to be a mirror. So if you ever have big omega of one function, then you must have big O of the other function essentially, as they are a parallel to each other. Now, moving on, let's take a look at some common growth rates. So first off, we have the two definitions for big O and big omega. We have f of n equals big O g of n, if and only if f of n is less than or equal to some coefficient times g of n. Then we have f of n equals big omega g of n, if and only if f of n is greater than or equal to some coefficient times g of n. And then on right over here, we have a chart of very common growth rates that we've already looked at previously, but we have a few more here. We have constant, log log, logarithmic, linear, n log n, this is linear rhythmic, quadratic and cubic, and then anything beyond two to three, we have just power for any positive integer m. Then we have exponential, and then finally we have factorial down here. So we also have four example problems here we have f of n squared equals either big o or big omega g of n cubed and then same thing for everything else we are looking at this question mark is it big o or is it big omega so 
one thing we can do is we are comparing on this. So this is our starting point, f of n squared. Well, this is quadratic time. So let's take a look over here. Let's mark this quadratic time. And then we are comparing that against cubic time. So we have this. And we know, if you look at this chart, you can tell that this is constantly degrading in performance. We start at constant time, which is an ideal time, which is a single computation being done, moving on to some more holistic, like log log, logarithmic, then what we can actually expect to see linear and linear rhythmic, and then continually getting worse until we get to power functions, exponential and factorial. So we can tell that it's constantly getting worse. So, look at in this direction, then f of n and squared is going to be less than or equal to n cubed gives us big O. So we're going to say that this is big O of cubed. And you can also tell real quick that if we kind of think about it this way, think of omega here and big O being here. All right? If we go from starting point to our new one and look at that direction, we're going towards big O. So that means we're big O here. So let's take a look at the other ones. So here we have f of 12 times n equals either big O or big omega, g of 4 times n. Okay, so this one is more interesting because it is going to deal more in the realm of that coefficient there because both of these are technically in linear time so if we look at it linear for the first one and linear for the second one so we're not moving anywhere and if we look at the coefficients real quick then we have f of n being 12 times n 12 times n and then we have a coefficient of 4 well, what if we plug in 1 as our coefficient? Actually, let's plug in 2. That gives us 8. Then, well, this one's less than or equal to 12. And then let's say we plug in 4 for a coefficient. Now, this gives us 16. So this one's greater. So we have a coefficient that's less than. We have a coefficient that's greater than. So it is both big O and big omega. So we can tell that this one is actually theta. They have identical growth rates. We can tell kind of because they're both linear and because we have coefficients that will be less than or greater than our current one. So moving on we have a linear runtime and a linear rhythmic runtime. So again let's mark first one linear. We mark linear rhythmic. Look at that direction it's going down. We know that f of n, which is linear, is going to be less than or equal to, because it's higher on the chart here, but this is also big O. Conversely, we also have 7 to the n, 5 to the n. Well, these are both exponential. However, there is a key point with exponential, and it is only going to go in one direction. We know for a fact, 7 to the n is always going to be greater than 5 to the n. There's not much the coefficient is going to be able to do in this case due to the nature of how exponential growth rates work. So we can't ignore the coefficient of c here. This actually matters quite a lot. So we can't say this is theta. What we can do is know that this is always getting worse. So look at 7 to the n. 5 to the end, because we're starting with 7 to the end, going to 5 to the end. We're going up, and we tell, yep, based on the same prospects of everything else, this is big omega. And then if we also look at f of n being 7 to the n, and g to the n uh, is 5 to the n, then we know that 7 to the n is indeed greater than or equal to 5 to the n. So this, by just math, also shows that it is big omega. Now, if we look real quick, we have big O, big theta, big O, big omega. That's exactly what we had on the previous slide, because those are the correct answers. And we can tell that by looking at the chart. 
Now, one thing I want to also touch on, something I briefly mentioned, is let's take a look at linear runtime right here. So, if I look at the actual binds on these, I can tell that I should have a bound like so. This is bigger. And I have my lower bound like so, which is big omega. So anything in this realm is going to be big O of n. Or at least exist in that realm. Like categorically, if we have big O of n, then technically you could have runtime of n cubed here. So this is at best what we can do. Big O, we cannot get better than that. So if you receive someone says, oh, big O of n. Well, that's linear runtime. It might have performance at some points that could be quadratic. This is just the theoretical best case, or at least what it cannot exceed. I won't say best case. You don't really want to analyze best or worst case scenarios too much with asymptote notation, but this is the theoretical limit that we cannot get any better than this. But if we had something, say, like, well, also real quick, you can tell that there's the overlap here that binds are at the same point, and that's where our average bound comes into play for theta. So this would transition to big O of, say, n cubed. Well, now this is where that goes into play. Everything better than n cubed, everything that's bound by big omega, is what we would ideally want. We'd want to transition to something that has better perceived runtime. Where if we had something like n to the 4, n to the 5, 5 to the 6, something exponential, or n factorial even, well, this is something we know that we definitely don't want because categorically, it's worse. Now again, this, if we have n cubed, doesn't mean that we're always at cubic time. It just means that this is the pretty much perceived best performance that we can get out of this current operation. And the same thing would happen if we had something like log in. Well, the only way you can get better than that is to have log log or constant time. And the only thing that you'd want to do with Omega is you want to get as close to big O of log n. So that's where you want to try to be consistent, is as close to the upper bound as you can possibly get. That's the true takeaway for asymptote notation. And that's why we look at big O so much, as we see the theoretical best case, again, I don't really want to say best case, but it's pretty much ideal of what we're looking at. Will we be able to achieve that? Not always. But again, that's our theoretical limit. And that is where we want to approach as close to as possible. So that is the overall look at asymptotic notation and time complexity and analyzing the general growth rates for algorithms. So again, this isn't to look at a best case scenario or worst case scenario. We want to look at basically categorizing the growth rates of function f, function g, maybe more. We just want two, two comparison points and say, what is the growth rate of this function versus the growth rate of this function? Can I say that this one is categorically better, not objectively better, but mostly can I expect it to perform better than the other one more often than not, essentially? Because what we're trying to determine is what is the most consistently efficient way of solving a problem. And we can look at big O, big omega, and big theta to try to get some idea of that. We're not going to be able to get it perfectly just because the nature of randomization and the complexity of algorithms isn't always cut and dry. It's not always written in stone. But... This gives us a general idea of how to approach that problem. So that's all I got. Uh, hopefully everything made sense. I know there's a lot to go over here and I know a lot of it can be 
a bit convoluted as to why we care about this and how to approach this problem. But overall, I hope you learned something. I'll see you next video.